All right, today we're going to take a look at the Watergate scandal that will result in the first and only, to date, resignation of an American president, uh, Richard Nixon, um, born in 1913, died in 1994, um, was one of the most complex political personalities um, of post-World War II America. Hundreds of books, thousands, millions of words have been written uh, trying to understand him, his personality, um, to, um, to document the events of his administration that resulted in this resignation. Um, so we'll begin by taking a very brief look at his background. Uh, Nixon was born in Whittier, California, uh, Southern California, uh, to a lower, I'm sorry, a working class family. Um, he went to college um, in California, uh, went to law school at Duke University. During World War II, um, was in the Navy um, in the South Pacific. And when the war is over, he, uh, he entered, um, he, he ran for office and uh, began his political career. In 1946, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from, uh, from his district in California, uh, very quickly establishing himself as a Cold War kind of politician, very fervently anti-communist, uh, determined to, um, to root out communism wherever, wherever um, it was encountered. In the United States, in 1950, he was elected to a U.S. Senate seat from California, so a very rapid rise from the House to the Senate. In 1952, he was, uh, he was elected vice president uh, running with Dwight Eisenhower um, as president, um, and they were re-elected in 1956, so he served eight years as vice president. In 1960, however, as the Republican nominee for the presidency, uh, he lost to John Kennedy. He tried to reboot his career in 1962, running to be California's governor, but lost. And at this point, it kind of looked like Nixon's career in politics was over. Um, I think even he thought it was over uh, because the night of that election in California, he gathered the press corps and he said to them, quote, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore because gentlemen, this is my last press conference. He did seem to think his uh, political career was done. But in 1968, he staged a political comeback. He was nominated by the Republicans uh, for the presidential, for the presidency once again in 1968 with his running mate, Spiro Agnew, governor of Maryland. And, uh, and, and they won that election, Nixon now becoming president then in 1969. Now we'll talk a little bit later when we look at the Cold War, we'll talk about Nixon's role uh, in in the in Cold War politics as president, but uh, but again, let's let's focus on the Watergate scandal. The Watergate scandal began as a small-time burglary uh, that occurred on June the seventeenth, nineteen seventy-two, in Washington D.C. Uh, on a tip, Washington police arrested five men who were trying to um, who had broken into the Democratic Party headquarters offices in the Watergate building. Um, those burglars were copying documents from the files of the office and planting an electronic eavesdropping device. They were planting a bug to be able to listen in on the conversations of the party leadership. Um, and again, the, uh, the location of that burglary will give the scandal its name. The Watergate is a luxurious um, um, condominium development, apartment buildings, a hotel, and tons and tons of offices uh, on the banks of the Potomac River. Um, still there. I've seen it. It's gorgeous. Um, it's right next to the Kennedy Center, uh, just up to the, uh, uh, up just up on the top of the slide there. Uh, but uh, but the, the Watergate uh, in question is, is indeed that building. Now, um, the five burglars were arrested, and it turned out that three of them uh, were on the payroll 
of a group called the Committee to Re-Elect the President. So it kind of seemed from the very beginning that there might be some connection with this break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters and the Nixon re-election campaign. It was 1972, Nixon would be running for re-election in November. Now, nothing much came of the um, of, of the break-in initially. There were no major investigations, um, but the Democratic Party nominee, George McGovern, uh, tried to make the break-in a campaign issue um, in the fall of 72. But, but let's note that from the very beginning, Richard Nixon and his campaign manager, John Mitchell, both had denied any knowledge of the incident. They knew nothing about the break-in. They denounced the burglars as common criminals. Uh, and Nixon will go on to defeat McGovern in the November election, easily winning re-election and a landslide victory against George McGovern. Nixon wins 61% of the popular vote, and he carried every state except Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. Now, I've always tried to give Richard Nixon the benefit of the doubt. Of the doubt. Let's, let's say he did not know about that break-in initially. Now, honestly, you know, all the research I've done and everything I've read about this, I, I, did, I think he did know, but let's just say he didn't. Um, he soon found out about it. Uh, it was just six days after that break-in. Um, we, we now know, because of the taped evidence from the White House that's been released over the years, we now know that, uh, uh, that, that from the beginning, Nixon tried to cover this up. Um, he, he learned that those, that those burglars had been acting on orders from people in his administration. They had been acting directly on orders from John Mitchell. John Mitchell Again, the, the, the campaign manager for the, for the 72 campaign, for the re-election campaign, and Nixon's former attorney general uh, from his first term. Um, the campaign is completely and totally involved in that break-in. Now, now, what we find from the taped evidence, again, that's not, that's not made public for years and years and years, but what we find is that immediately when Nixon finds out about this break-in, he told his staff, to offer about $400,000 to those burglars as hush money um, uh, for, th for them to keep it quiet, to, uh, to take the blame and not implicate anybody in the administration, not implicate the campaign. Um, and in fact, he said on those tapes, and I quote, I want you to stonewall it, he said. Cover it up, cover it up. Now, what we find is that two of those burglars refused the bribe, and, and they told a judge that they had been taking orders from, and I quote, a highly placed administration officials, official. He didn't name names, but, but in a sense said, hey, our orders came from the White House. Now, in reality, let's just note that, uh, that the group that carried out this burglary uh, was part of a group known as the plumbers. Um, as Attorney General John Mitchell had put this group together, a special investigation unit, um, to, to try to find information about those who were leaking uh, information to the media from the Nixon administration. Uh, the plumbers' jobs um, involved illegal break-ins to find compromising information about anyone who criticized Nixon or anyone who leaked information from the uh, from, from the White House. Um, so, so again, th this, this group was longstanding, and, uh, and, and they're the ones who, who broke in uh, to those Democratic Party headquarters. Now, we first begin to hear about this story uh, in the summer of 1972 from two young reporters at the Washington Post newspaper. They were Robert Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Uh, they were working the night shift. 
Uh, they were listening to the police radios to hear about what, whatever burglaries had occurred that, that night. I mean, these guys were just starting their career. Um, and, and, and they're kind of intrigued by this, uh, by this burglary at the Democratic Party headquarters. Um, in, on the slide, uh, you see Woodward and Bernstein as young men and uh, at the bottom uh, as, they, as they look today. Um, it's interesting to note that, um, that as they began their investigations uh, about this burglary, they, they made contact with an anonymous informer, um, someone who worked in Washington, um, who had information that could help these two reporters uncover the, um, the story of this break-in and, and how the president or his administration might be involved. Now, their informer insisted on anonymity. He did not want his name used in, in, the, in the newspaper reports. Um, he, he swore Woodward and Bernstein to secrecy, um, that, uh, that, that they, he would only allow his name to be known after his death. And, and so they called him Deep Throat. Deep Throat, after a rather notorious pornographic movie of the time, I'm sorry. Um, but Deep Throat was really important in helping them to, uh, to connect the dots. Um, Deep Throat knew a lot, as we'll see in just a minute, um, especially about what was going on in the FBI. And, uh, and with his help um, and, uh, and contacts, Wilbert and Bernstein were able to make a lot of headway in, in determining what had happened. Um, Deep Throat uh, eventually will be revealed. Um, it turns out that, uh, uh, that he himself um, decided to reveal his identity about a year before he died. Um, he, uh, he came out, as it were. Deep Throat was Mark Felt, who was the deputy director of the FBI. And yeah, he knew a lot of information about what Nixon was doing, uh, what the administration was doing uh, to, um, to illegal activities of the administration. And, uh, and, and so he is the guy, one of the major um, contributors to, uh, to the knowledge of this story. Um, this was felt in 2005 when he revealed himself to the media there he is waving, hi, I'm Deep Throat. Uh, he died about a year later. Now, as the newspaper reports in the Washington Post began to be printed, as Wilbert and Bernstein found more and more information and, and um, evidence of, of, um, of wrongdoing in the Nixon White House, um, the Senate will establish an investigating committee to start looking into Watergate themselves, as will the House of Representatives. More and more newspapers also began to put reporters on the story. And, uh, and as the investigation really gets fully underway in 1973, um, you, you begin to, to find out that there's an awful lot of illegal activities going on in the Nixon White House. Because it turned out that Richard Nixon had a rather paranoid personality. Um, Nixon, Nixon really seemed to believe that people were just out to get him. And he had compiled an enemies list. He had compiled a list of, uh, of reporters and, and other politicians and, and entertainers and, and intellectuals who were criticizing him, um, who, were, um, who were against him. Um, and uh, and he, he was kind of determined to hit back. Again, the plumbers organization that uh, Mitchell had put together, I mean, part of their job was finding out information, compromising information about the so-called enemies on Nixon's list um, in order to try to discredit um, anyone who, who criticized the administration. Um, so what we begin to find out is, is that there were a lot of dirty tricks, as they were called in the press, uh, a lot of illegal activities going on in the Nixon White House. 
uh, for example. Uh, it's known that at one point Nixon discussed um, involving the CIA in, in a plot to, uh, to stop the investigations of the administration uh, during the, the Watergate uh, investigations. Uh, we know that, uh, that they used the IRS and the FBI to go after the so-called enemies. Um, staffers who later wrote books and, and gave interviews on the, uh, on the administration essentially said that they were told that anything, uh, anything against Nixon's enemies was acceptable, that, uh, that they could use the full power of the federal government to, and I quote, screw our political enemies, unquote. Um, so Nixon might order uh, that the IRS start a tax audit on somebody uh, who was uh, who was against him, or, or that or that the FBI start a start an investigative file on that person. Can, can we find information that can then put them in a bad light so that if they criticize Nixon, they won't be believed? Um, you know, we, we are talking about some major um, presidential abuse of power here. And, and, as, and as more and more of these stories were revealed, um, Nixon was, was accused of having an imperial presidency. Uh, many said he was acting like a king, that he was so arrogant in his possession of power, um, and that he and his advisors seemed to believe that they were above the law. Um, and, and in actuality, I think that that's exactly what Richard Nixon believed. Several years after the resignation, he gave a series of interviews to David Frost of the BBC. Um, and in one of those interviews, he just flat out said, quote, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. In other words, he was saying that whatever a president does is okay. Even if they're breaking laws, if the president does it or orders it, that means it's okay. He believed that the president was above the law. Now, as these investigations then um, continued throughout 1973, many of the um, staff members in the administration began to get worried because it was pretty clear that, that somebody was going to have to be blamed for Watergate, that somebody was going to have to be the scapegoat uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to get Nixon off the hook. And, and you start to see a lot of administration staffers resigning their jobs, um, leaving the administration, and some of them are going to talk to Congress. Some of them are going to talk to the Senate. And two of the most prominent of the former administration uh, staffers that testified uh, were John Dean, who was the White House attorney. He admitted to, uh, to helping Nixon uh, in the cover-up and in, um, in helping to, uh, uh, to, to, to bribe the burglars. And uh, another, Alexander Butterfield, who will eventually reveal the existence of a taping system within, within the White House. Um, but, but as all these investigations were going on, in the fall of 1973, the vice president is going to have his own unrelated scandal. Vice President Spiro Agnew, again, former governor of Maryland, um, ended up having to plead no contest to charges of income tax evasion and bribery. No contest, meaning essentially, yep, I did it. I did it. Um, as a result, uh, Agnew resigns as uh, vice president in October of 1973. Now, uh, the 25th Amendment of the Constitution gives the president the authority, if there's a vacancy in the vice presidency, to appoint a new vice president uh, with the consent of, of the Senate. And so the new vice president, handpicked by Richard Nixon, will be Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford was a uh, representative um, from Michigan um, with a reputation for honesty and, and um, 
integrity. All right, but even with the diversion of the vice presidential scandal, the investigation goes on. Um, and as I noted earlier, uh, Alexander Butterfield had, really, had re revealed to the Senate the existence of a taping system within the White House. Uh, now, there was nothing wrong with that in theory. I mean, every president since Franklin Roosevelt had had a taping system in place because honestly, it kind of makes sense uh, to tape the conversations in the Oval Office so that you know what everybody has said and what everyone has agreed to. But it also makes sense to maybe turn them off on occasion. And um, Nixon just kind of let them run. And it turns out that discussions about Watergate had been recorded. And so the battle to hear the tapes begins. Now, in the beginning of this investigation, the Justice Department had appointed a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, to, uh, to investigate Watergate. Now, a special prosecutor is supposed to be fair and impartial. He's nonpartisan. He has no, uh, the president has no authority over him. Uh, he reports only to the Attorney General. Um, but when Archibald Cox finds out about the White House tapes. He wants to hear them. He wants to hear them, as did the House Investigating Committee and the Senate. Now, Nixon refused to hand over the tapes to anybody. He cited executive privilege. I'm the president. They're my tapes. They got they got secret stuff on them. You know, they got stuff related to national security. I'm not going to hand them over to anybody. So Cox obtained a court order that would require Nixon to turn them over. And at this point, Nixon decided that Cox needed to go. That Cox should be fired. Now consider that if someone is investigating you and you get rid of them, doesn't that make you look just a little bit guilty? Nixon didn't care. Nixon thinks he's above the law. So the night of October the 20th, 1973, Nixon goes to the, uh, to the Justice Department and tells the Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire Cox. Now, Richardson, when he'd become Attorney General, had sworn to the Senate that he would not interfere with the Watergate investigation. So when he was ordered to fire Cox, he refused. Instead, he resigned. He would not carry out this order that he believed, if not illegal, was certainly unethical. So Nixon then goes to the Deputy Attorney General, who's now the Acting Attorney General, William Ruckel, Ruckel's House, and he told Ruckel House, Ruckel's House sorry, to fire Cox. Ruckel's House resigned rather than do it. So Nixon goes down to the third level of authority in the Justice Department to the Solicitor General, Robert Bork, and Bork carried out the firing. He fired Archibald Cox. And because this occurred on a Saturday night, the press called this the Saturday Night Massacre. Heads were rolling, right? The Attorney General had resigned, the Assistant Attorney General had resigned, and Cox had been fired. Now, let's just note, this is the event that turns the country against Nixon. Because once it hits the newspapers, you're going to see thousands of letters and telegrams flooding Congress demanding that Nixon be impeached. Nixon's approval ratings plunged to 17%. Only 17% of the American people approved of the job that he was doing. That is the lowest approval rating of a president in history. And we should note that this did not end the investigation. A new special prosecutor would be appointed. 
His name was Leon Jaworski. And he will continue with this investigation. And as the investigation continues, the stakes are becoming higher and higher. Nixon will release some transcripts of some tapes, but he chose the ones to be released. And it turned out that there, were a, a, there was a lot of missing information. You know, 15, 20 minutes of, of taped information would have been removed from the transcripts. It was very, very clear that material from these transcripts that Nixon was allowing Jaworski to hear was being suppressed. And so once again, Jaworski got a court order requiring Nixon to turn over the tapes, all 64 of them, and Nixon again refused to comply. And so now the case of the tapes went to the Supreme Court in a case called United States versus Richard M. Nixon. The court now, the Supreme Court will make the next decision. On July 24, 1974, the Supreme Court ruled against Richard Nixon. Unanimously, the court ruled that he must turn over all 64 tapes to the special prosecutor. The court said in their decision that no one, not even the president, could withhold evidence that is relevant in a criminal trial, that no one is above the law. Nixon considered at this point defying the court, but we should also note that the House Judiciary Committee was also drawing up three articles of impeachment. Now impeachment means to charge an official with violations of the Constitution. It's not a criminal thing. Impeachment is the first step in a process that could result in the removal of a president from office. And it's the job of the House of Representatives to, to impeach a president, to charge a president with certain offenses. The House Judiciary Committee then, in uh, July of 1974, um, drew up three articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. Now, once the committee has those articles of impeachment, they pass them on to the full House for a vote. If the House accepts those articles of impeachment, then a president is impeached. In other words, he is charged with these violations. If a president is impeached, then there'll be a trial in the Senate. You have to have two thirds of the Senate agree to convict. But if the president is convicted, he would be removed from office. So let's see what these articles of impeachment were. First, obstruction of justice. This had to do with the payment of the hush money to the burglars uh, it had to do with withholding evidence, the tapes specifically, and it had to do with firing the special prosecutor, um, Archibald Cox. Second, abuse of power. Primarily the use of federal agencies to deprive citizens of their constitutional rights. Um, you know, the IRS, the FBI, you know, using, using taxpayer dollars the people's government to, uh, to to spy on American citizens to to deny them their their civil rights. And third, contempt of Congress. Essentially, Nixon's refusal to cooperate with the House and Senate investigations, and especially withholding the tapes. Now, the full House was on recess, summer recess. 
Uh, and so once the articles of impeachment were, draw, were drawn up, it was going to be several days before the full House could uh, convene in Washington for the final vote. But before the full House could meet and vote on impeachment, Richard Nixon resigned. A group of Republican senators and uh, and members of the House had gone to the White House and told Nixon that he would be impeached, that he did not have enough support in the House of Representatives to avoid impeachment. And they went on further to tell him that he would be convicted in the Senate, that there were simply not enough votes in the Senate to get him out of this, and thus that he would be removed from office. With that knowledge, Richard Nixon decided to resign. He did not want to be the first president removed from office through impeachment and conviction. His resignation was effective on August the 9th, 1974 at noon. Here's Nixon giving his final talk to his uh, White House staff. Nixon boarding the helicopter with the big V for victory signs, one of Nixon's trademark gestures. And Gerald Ford at noon, taking the oath of office from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court with his wife at his side. Now, as I said earlier, uh, Ford had a reputation for honesty and integrity. He'd been a member of the House of Representatives for um, for a couple of decades. Um, and in the first few weeks of his presidency, he got rave reviews from the media. But within a month of taking office in September of 1974, Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon for any crimes that he might have committed in office. He gave him a full and complete pardon from having to face the consequences of any illegal activities that he may have uh, ordered or condoned. Now, Ford said that he did this in order to end the national obsession with Watergate, to allow the American people to put Watergate behind them and, and get on with things, in a sense. There are some who claim that, uh, that there must have been a deal made there are many who believe that uh, Nixon had made Ford vice president with the agreement that if he needed one, Ford would issue a pardon. Both men denied any deal. But honestly, I'm just going to say we don't really know. Who knows what was said? Who knows what was agreed to? We should know that in 1976, Gerald Ford ran for his own term as president after finishing the last two years of Nixon's term. And he was defeated in the election of 76, losing to the former governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter. And a lot of people said they didn't vote for Ford because of the pardon. Many people wanted to see Nixon have to appear in court. Many people believed that he should have to deal with the consequences of his actions. In the end, Watergate resulted then in the first and only to date presidential resignation in American history. In addition, 69 government officials were charged with crimes related to Watergate. 48 of them were convicted and 29 served prison terms, including John Mitchell, the former attorney general and campaign manager. This is one of the things that will lead to the distrust that so many Americans have of their government and their politicians. 
Can a president be trusted anymore? Are, are, are all politicians just a bunch of crooks? How much corruption is there in government? A poll taken after the resignation asked Americans how much faith they had in the executive branch of government, the presidency, and over half said hardly any. But let's finally note that in so many ways, Richard Nixon was his own worst enemy. A political cartoon that, uh, that made that point. Nixon may have had enemies lists, the people that he thought were against him, but, but let's just consider how many ways during, right after that, that break-in and throughout the investigations, how many ways did Nixon serve to make it worse? How many things did Nixon do that, that dug him deeper and deeper into the process that resulted in the end of his political career? Let's consider the cover-up, first of all. You know, if, if you're caught doing something, you know, the easiest thing he could have done was say, okay, I'm sorry, we did it, I did it, I'm sorry, I, I, I fired everybody involved and I'll never do it again. Maybe it would have kind of gone away. Maybe they wouldn't have discovered all of the illegal activities going on in the White House. Consider his firing of Archibald Cox. Again, you don't fire the guy who's investigating you because it makes you look like you're guilty. Again, that's the thing that turned the nation against him. Just consider the tapes, you yeah. know, you got court orders against you. Yeah, you, you. Everyone wants to hear those tapes. He refused to turn them over. He refused to cooperate with the, with the investigation. He just kept digging his own grave deeper and deeper and deeper. And in the older assignment, I'm going to ask you to think about that. I'm going to ask you to think about how Richard Nixon was his own worst enemy. And with that, we're done tonight. <laughs>